So this observation regarding the films of South Korean filmmaker Hong Sang-soo was born from a consideration of two completely unrelated films, Martin McDonough's The Banshees of Inishirin and an old BBC documentary called The Hermits of Borolula. In The Banshees of Inishirin, we find a clear tension between two different ways of life, one dedicated to the pursuit of artistic greatness and one content with the simple pleasures of an ordinary, unimpactful life. I think that anyone who considers pursuing a career in the arts at one point or another is confronted with the question of one's position within the history of the given medium, the tradition. How will my work be remembered? Will it stand the test of time? You might also wonder, who am I making this for? Who is my audience? Am I making art to satisfy an imagined, universal audience who will welcome my work into the halls of eternity, that great museum of mankind's masterpieces? Or am I just making art to satisfy myself? Am I my own audience? Of course, this applies not only to art, but to life in general. Should our actions be turned toward coming history, invested in contributing to mankind's future in some way, leaving a mark, so to speak? Or is it perfectly fine to simply live for ourselves, do as we please, be content to leave without a trace? All of our works, whether artistic, political, architectural, whatever, all of our works contribute to that ever-expanding fabric of mankind's history. But between those great works, there are countless people whose names do not echo throughout eternity, names that have simply been forgotten. In this 1962 documentary produced for the BBC, David Attenborough visits a ghost town in northern Australia, Borolula. There he interviews two of the town's last few inhabitants. Jack, what do you reckon keeps a man in this country? It, it must be a pretty lonely sort of life. Oh, no, uh, well, that all depends. Uh, I've never been lonely in my life. Hmm. There's always been so much in life. I could never honestly say I was lonely. Hmm. I've lived for years on my own, in the desert. Haven't seen anyone for months, but I've never been lonely. The trees are company and the birds and uh, all the rest of it. You're a man who likes solitude, I imagine. Oh, indeed, I do. Like, I, I, I don't know if it's vanity, I'm very fond of my own company. I never feel lonely. Never? No, well, that would hardly be honest, because oh, I've mostly always had a mate, a female, like a... a and prior to that, I, w I lived in civilization. I, uh, I got married about 30. Well, uh, I hadn't developed this superiority complex, you know. I, I found out that I couldn't get any better company than my own by then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd already learned enough off my fellows, have we? These are men who have decidedly turned their backs on society, on that great community of mankind to which each of our individual actions and works contribute. They have intentionally excised themselves as much as possible from that continuity, and they are perfectly satisfied with that kind of life. Would you describe yourself as a happy, contented man? I should say so. The gods have been very good to me. Yeah. I consider myself a remarkable fella. Why remarkable? Well, I'm, I'm reasonably happy and contented. Yeah. Well, there are not many people who can sit down and say that they're happy and contented. Oh, yes, well, of course, there's a screw loose somewhere. Yeah. Definitely a screw loose. Are you seeking loneliness? No, not loneliness. I want you to understand I'm not a bit lonely. You're not? No. Oh, goodness, no. If you said isolation, well, that'd be slightly different. Yeah, I could say yes. I'm fond of isolation, but I couldn't really talk of loneliness because I don't know what it is. Uh, but I gather that some men, it's overpowering. Yes. Talk to a stump or anything, eh? Well, I suppose I would, in a way. Do you in talk... fact... Do you talk to the birds? Oh, yes, and talk to myself, too. Do you? Yes, quite often. You get the best answers that way? Yes, it improves my <laughs> mental state too, talking to an intelligent man. Yes. <laughs> we are shown the remnants of the town library, the pages of its books eaten away by termites over the years, and hard not to see in this an embodiment of that dichotomy previously described, even a kind of irony. Here we have the men who live only for the present, content in their isolation, somehow now immortalised on screen, 
while the books, the great works of man, slowly fade away. An inversion of the expected order of things, where the masterpieces remain, persist through time, and those solitary men who live for nothing but the present are forgotten. The film even records music played by the so-called Mad Fiddler, who speaks to no one and does not show his face in the film. And we also hear one man's poem, which presumably without these cameras and microphones would otherwise have been lost to the sands of time. For some reason, this happened to get me thinking about one of Hong sang Su's most recent films, because I think that sang Su's filmography can be characterised as having gradually closed in on itself. His films, more and more over time, have turned toward an intimate minimalism, focusing in on subject matter that seems close to home for the filmmaker. Stories of actors, directors, writers, always at an impasse in their lives. Hard to deny that most of these films feel like sang Su's simply wrote a script overnight, gathered a few actor friends, and then spent a couple days shooting. It's like his circle of production is getting smaller and smaller with each project. He's created an approach to filmmaking that seemingly requires minimal effort and preparation. Needless to say, his visual style reflects this. Entire scenes are composed in these long, wide shots, with very minimal movement and blocking, only the occasional zoom, just characters talking in a handful of locations, apartments, cafes, parks. Over the years, Hong sang Su has condensed his films down to the these little dramatic diamonds, and I think his work is all the better for it. If you watch a few of these films back to back and genuinely open yourself up to his particular style, you do become entranced by the languid pace, the rotation of familiar characters and scenarios, the hints of magical realism here and there. And I think the reason these films are never boring, to me at least, is because they're not about the very little that is actually occurring on screen. They are about everything that is not happening, that is not shown, the world not included in the film, the characters and stories just outside the frame, the camera movements that Sang Su refuses to make. In this sense, Sang Su's cinema is negative. It carves out a world, refuses it, leaving only these quiet moments of indecision, of waiting, meandering, of hesitation, confusion, simmering dissatisfaction. Sometimes it feels like you're actually watching the moments in between the important scenes of the actual plot. It's no surprise that The Green Ray is Song Su's favourite Romare film, seeing as it's all about a character who repeatedly refuses to do anything throughout the film. But I think that over time, Song Su has transcended his Romarian influence and attained this style completely unlike anything else. The novelist's film, one of his most recent endeavours, feels like a great culmination of this trend in Sang Su's filmmaking. It articulates the refusal very clearly, and ends with a perfect illustration of what that refusal produces, a scene of such effortless beauty and tranquility. And in this film, the reductive approach to production also mirrors the state of mind of the main characters. Kim Min Hee's character is a popular actress who has taken a step back from her career. She's tired of the pressure she feels to return to acting and work in big movies. In one scene, she encounters a director who suggests she's wasting her talent. And here, the titular novelist, played by Lee Hye Young, is with her and defends her, saying that she has no obligation to make movies just because other people want her to. And here again we find that tension between a simple life or a life dedicated to producing those great works. In the end, Kim Min His character agrees to act in a short film the novelist wants to make herself, and at the very end of the film the viewer is shown what we can only assume is the novelist's film. But the end result is no great work, no masterpiece. It's closer to a home movie than a real film. Having a novelist make a film instead of a director is perhaps precisely the excuse Sang Su needed to finally make a non-film, an anti-film. Just walking around with a camera, filming the beautiful Kim Min Hee as she puts together an improvised bouquet of flowers. This is a film that drills inward toward contentment, toward an almost formless kind of simplicity and beauty. Because this beauty does not reach out to greatness, it resides content within itself. The scenes we are shown at the end are meaningless. They resist interpretation. They refuse the burden of significance. To me, these scenes simply show a man filming the woman he loves. And including this kind of sequence in a film is 
a gift, a meaningless gesture. Sang Su has become a kind of filmmaking hermit, and perhaps there's an irony to the fact that Hong Sang Su is making great art out of the idea of not making great art, and his films explore and possibly even resolve that tension between the yearning for legacy, for greatness, for a chance to weave one's work into that fabric of human history, and the yearning for a simple, secluded life lived only for itself embodied both within the stories he writes, as well as in the very method of his production, a perfect marriage of form and content. What are you looking for? Well, I'm supposed to be looking for copper or gold, silver lead or something like that, but uh, I'm looking for contentment mostly. For contentment? Yeah. Of course, the prospector wouldn't admit that, but... uh, Most of them are doing just that very thing, looking for contentment. Do they find it? I think they do. Do you find it? I find it, yes. I'm I'm still uh, the same as I was when I was 25. I'd like to see what's over the next hill. Yeah. And that's a reward for life in itself? I I consider it is, yes. Have you ever found any diamonds or gold or...? Oh, yes, I've found a little bit. I've found a little bit of opal, a little bit of gold, found copper. You ever exploited them? No, I've sent samples away, parcels away, but never did any good, which is typical of most prospectors. <laughs> well, wasn't that pretty disappointing? Oh, no. No, it would break a man's heart if he did discover anything. What would there be to live for? Nothing. Truly? Well, there's nothing in life. If you're a lot of money, what's good money to you? Well, it can make life comfortable, easy. Yes, well, what are you going to do? Drink it? Give it away to women? Something like that? Buy a few motor cars? A yacht or two or something like that? Mm. No, I can see nothing in that. 